Thank you so much, Richard. I'm used to passing the mic off to you at this point, so this is a nice change of pace here. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome again. My name is Nathan Nelson. I'm the pastor of Mission and Outreach here at Bethany, and it is a joy to be with you, whether you're online or those of you gathered in the sanctuary. Hello. Your faces look great. What little bit of them I can see. It's nice to be together. Well, as we've been going through this Common Compassion Initiative, I have been reflecting a lot on the different experiences that I've had with folks on the streets. And uh, when I was in high school, I used to volunteer at a resource center for folks experiencing homelessness in Portland. And I'll never forget one experience that I had when I went um, down to do this. There's a meal that gets kind of distributed in the evening and and the rest of us was just kind of there to help out. And so we're we're sort of standing in line and mingling with people and an older looking gentleman sits down at a piano that was in the corner of the room. And this guy looks like he's been on the streets for quite some time, Um, but he starts to play a very familiar tune. And uh, before you know it, you hear him sort of bellowing out with this gravelly, loud, um, amazing voice, lean on me. And then everyone, literally everyone, I felt like I was in a like, modern day flash mob or something, but I didn't get the cue, starts singing in chorus with him. When you're not strong, I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on. And I thought to myself, What is happening? This is crazy. And as I reflected on it, what came to my attention is the reality that everybody that was in that room had experienced trauma above trauma upon trauma and had lives full of challenge and beauty and love. And so what, when I was thinking about today, Pentecost Sunday, what I, what I thought is, you know what? This was like a modern day Pentecost moment for me with one accord, people singing with one voice from all different backgrounds. And that's what Pentecost Sunday is all about. And so on this Pentecost Sunday, what I want us to see as we begin a new series, turning the corner now from the text that we've been going through in James during the Common Compassion series to a new series titled, Be Thou My Vision, that this is our hope, that as on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit might come and give us eyes to see and discern our calling to participate with what God is doing in our world right now. And so in the weeks ahead, today we're gonna start this series by looking around and seeing what is God doing in our midst. And then we're going to look forward, and then, or excuse me, look back, and then we're going to look forward. And so that's where we're headed. Um, And so as we prepare our hearts now to look around and discern, God, what are you doing in our midst today? And how am I called to be a part of that? Would you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Father, what a gift. What an extraordinary gift to be your children, to be part of your work in the world, to know, Lord, that we are loved by you despite whatever love we do or don't experience in this life from others. And yet it's our hope, it's our desire, God, that we would be unified with one another, that we would be your presence, oh Lord, of love, of compassion to one another, housed and unhoused, black and white, citizenship, and awaiting a status to call a place home. So Father, would you unite us now as we discern your spirit in our midst that we might be your presence in this world evermore. So it's towards that and that we commit ourselves to your word in your name, amen. Well, what I'd like to do is sort of set the stage for us now as we hop into the text for today. And there are all kinds of things that can keep us from doing this thing I'm referring to, from looking around and seeing what God is doing in our midst. One author makes the case that as people, our attention is constantly being pulled between two sort of polar opposites, beauty and suffering in our world, or beauty and brokenness. And there's sort of two consequences of this paradigm. The first, if we only look at the beauty, we can become blind to the suffering. And for many of us, this can be the temptation when our personal lives just seem like things have become too much or the world around us seems to be imploding. Has any of you felt that way recently? We can sort of live for vacation at that point, center our lives around a single hobby or spend all of our days, I don't know, skiing or in my case, trapezing. We can make our life all about our job, which is a God-given gift to us and yet, we can spend a disproportionate amount of our time and our energy on these things. Or in the other direction, uh, we can 
become sort of enthralled with the beauty in our world alone. And uh, we can sort of turn away from the suffering. And as we do that, we disengage. And when we look around and, and if all we see is the suffering around us, then we can quickly become pessimistic people, right? We can become sinister people that uh, we sort of have no hope then for the world beyond what little we see and can control in front of us. We start sort of storing up our money. We seek the best for ourselves and our families. And we say to the rest of the things we see in the world, you know what, not my problem. Someone else will take care of it. It's out of my control. So these are the consequences. In both cases, we disengage when we, when we become solely fixated on either the beauty or the suffering in our world. And so what's at stake here, friends, is that if we miss Christ's call to both hold the beauty and the suffering of our world uh, in, in sort of glorious tension with one another, is that we could miss our calling altogether. We could wake up and we could sort of go, you know what, what am I doing here? What is my purpose? And so what I would suggest to you this morning is that if you find yourself in that place, perhaps you've found yourself at an imbalance between an ability to engage with both the suffering and the beauty of our world. And so what I think we need is a lens through which we can see both of these. And we can hold them lovingly, mercifully, compassionately together. And uh, what I'd like to suggest is that uh, if, it w and what I think the text is illuminating for us this morning is that that lens is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit alive within us can allow us to resist sort of the depression or the apathy or the cynicism that comes from the world's suffering or the naive sort of ambivalent rose-colored glasses we put on when we ignore the suffering and fixate solely on the beauty. So the Holy Spirit is what enables us to look around, to see the world for all that it is, and to engage rather than disengage and do, as Micah 6, 8 famously says for us, to be people of love and mercy and justice and humility. And so as we turn our attention to the text from Acts 2, uh, the narrative that sort of uh, recalls for us the events of Pentecost all that time ago, what we see are three gifts from the Holy Spirit that equip us to engage in this calling to be people of hope. The first of which is the gift of unity in our diversity, the capacity to be unified in our diversity. And the second, the gift of everyone having a role to play. And third, empowerment of all people, especially the marginalized. So let's begin with this first gift from the Holy Spirit, the capacity for unity in our diversity. Just a couple of weeks ago, I had what was perhaps a great test as a pastor. I might even suggest to our leadership here that this be um, a future sort of uh, trial for um, the pastoral licensure process. If you don't know, uh, I've talked about this many times. My wife and I do flying trapeze. We're part of the circus community here in Seattle. And when you do this thing, you have to ascend like a 30-foot ladder up to a platform where there's a bar waiting for you, which will enable you to sail yourself through the air. And at the top of the platform, there's generally a coach there who's waiting to serve you the bar. And so you get kind of, it's an intimate moment up there, right? Like, I don't know, maybe I'm going to die. Here I go. And this is the last person I'm going to talk to. And uh, there was on one occasion when, uh, not so long ago, when I was um, up there on the platform and one of a dear friend of mine and coach at uh, was talking to me and just asking, you know, how are things going? What's going on? And <clears throat> this was at the outset of our Common Compassion, <clears throat> excuse me, Common Compassion Initiative. And I said, well, you know, we're getting this thing started at work. It's kind of going to be a big deal. We're trying to raise some money. And, you know, beyond that, we're trying to sort of awaken compassion in people for the unhoused. This is going to run from about Easter to Pentecost. And right about then, I see this gal's face sort of turn like sour. And I was like, oh my gosh, have I offended you? And she said, Nathan, I know you're a pastor, but are you Pentecostal? And I could tell you in that moment, I thought to myself, oh boy, this gal has some negative experiences with this thing that she understands to be Pentecostal. 
And now all of you Pentecostals in the room, please have no fear. This is no slight on you. It's just simply to say this person's experience was apparently negative. And I now felt it incumbent upon me in the like 30 seconds I had left before I fly, sail myself through the air to explain what exactly is this thing called Pentecost or Pentecostal. And so um, I went about doing that and I honestly cannot tell you exactly what I said. But what I can tell you, thank you, Eric, is that um, what I recall trying to illuminate is this idea that, you know what? The day of Pentecost, though it has been used in many points throughout history, especially in the Christian tradition, to draw lines between those that are in or those that are out, right? Those that can speak in tongues, those that can't. Those that can display a certain spiritual gift and those that can't. Pentecost is all about the direct opposite, is it not? It is a moment in our history. It is actually, it marcates the beginning of the church when the Holy Spirit comes in a diverse people from all different backgrounds and says, I am here. I am the through thread for all of your lives. That in all of your diversity, you can, you will, you must be unified. And somehow that was lost on my friend. So if some version of the passion I just articulated to you all uh, came out with her, I hope it did, um, we might have corrected as some understanding of Pentecost there. But this is what is so critical for us on this day is that we realize that Pentecost is in fact this opportunity to be reminded of what it is that God is calling us to as a people, to be unified in our diversity. Man, do we need that today. Amen? Acts 2, 3 to 6 reads this. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now that we're staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven and earth. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Biblical commentator Willie Jennings reflects on this very text and and says this. Here we must not draw back from what is being displayed in Luke's account. This is God touching, taking hold of tongue and voice, mind, heart, and body. This is a joining, unprecedented, unanticipated, unwanted, yet complete joining. Those gathered in prayer asked for power, They may have asked for the Holy Spirit to come, but they did not ask for this. This is real grace, untamed grace. It is the grace that replaces our fantasies for power over people with God's fantasies for power, for desire for people. And so you see, these were people who had no shortage of differences, and yet the Holy Spirit unites them, brings them together, and gives them a common ability to relate with one another in their speech. As scripture puts it, a common understanding of one another. And the beauty here, of course, is that with a common understanding, barriers to to community and connection are brought down, right? This marks the beginning of the church, and it's from this place that we are sent into the world to be the presence of Christ to be a unifying force in our world. And so you see at the tension here between beauty and suffering happening is that while that constantly fights for our attention, when we look around and all that we see is that difference or those barriers between us and another, God desires to awaken the spirit within us and enable us to be a people of another way. One where diversity is not a problem, but a means by which the fullness of God might more clearly be seen and experienced. Only then, perhaps, can we be peacemakers, address the brokenness and the suffering in our world head on while making Christ's beautiful vision for a unified people a reality out of us. And so I invite you to ask yourself as we close this first point, What barriers exist between you and people who are different from you? This brings us to our second 
gift of the Holy Spirit, a role for everyone to play. Now, something that I find fascinating about this passage is the reaction of the group of onlookers. So in verse 12 and 13, we read this. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Now, last I checked, excessive alcohol consumption could not be correlated with the ability to articulate with perfection different languages, right? It's much to the contrary, is it not, <laughs> right? And so the truth is, that is a ridiculous explanation. But what we see instead is a people who are coming up against something, they're witnessing something, and they're going, that's strange, that's odd, that's another. And so that, that oddity causes them to say, to reject it, right? To say, no, this can't be. Perhaps you've seen this in your social media feeds uh, throughout COVID. We've become accustomed to this norm of people warring back and forth, right? Uh, it's sort of, I post one article, then I comment on that, and then I counter with another article. And someone uh, occasionally might make like a thoughtful, considerate post in the comments. And then that person, have you seen this happen? Just gets berated, right? They're told, come on, show some passion. You, you know, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, you know, you're ignorant, you're dumb. Simply because they didn't make a strong stance one way or another. And so you see, when we're on the outside looking in, this notion of beauty, of unity and peacemaking can often offend us. We've so given way at that point to our disengagement, a result of our apathy or our compassion fatigue, that we find ourselves outside the story. We're sort of sideline critics with no skin in the game, looking in and what we see, of course, is that's not our calling. Our calling is to engage. Acts 2.17 says, in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So Peter recites these words from the Old Testament, a prophecy of Joel, in response to these onlookers making fun. And Peter reminds them that while this might not look sort of or this might look crazy in contrast to the norm of society around them, this was spoken of long ago. God's spirit would well up in people, all people, men and women, young and old, testifying to this reality of God's presence in and through all of creation. And the same thing happened at the end of John chapter nine, after Jesus heals a blind man, the Pharisees come and they have sort of a committee meeting, if you will. And they determine, you know what? This can't possibly be of God because Jesus healed this blind man on the Sabbath. And so they reject it, right? It's contrary to their expectation. And so they determine for themselves, oh, that can't be of God. Richard Austin in his book, The Beauty of the Lord, writes, the perverse human quality Christians call sin includes our capacity to hurt ourselves and others. Many believers associate sin with sensuality and more intellectual Christians usually link it to selfishness. Jesus, by contrast, often associated sin with insensibility or determined seemingly willful inability to feel or to perceive. Is that a convicting word for you today? I know it is for me. Friends, Matthew eleven fifteen says, if you have ears, then hear. Today and every day, God is calling you not to be a sideline critic, but calling you back into the game, into his story of transformation and redemption in the world. Have you disengaged through COVID? Maybe you can pinpoint the moment when you said, you know what, I've had enough. Or maybe you, can, uh, you can't find that single moment, but it's as if to say you find yourself looking around wondering, what am I even doing? 
You want to be a part of something meaningful, but everything just seems so mundane, so uninteresting, or whatever is within your grasp seems ultimately unimportant within the larger scheme of things. If that's you today, I want you to hear the Spirit saying to you, look around. Look here. See this beauty. Look over here. See this pain. I've got a role for you to play in the redemption of it all. And this brings us to our third and final gift of the Spirit that I want to highlight for us today. The empowerment of all people, especially the marginalized. We all have our reasons for being sidelined from God's story. Some self-inflicted, others the result of a broken world, the sins of broken people and broken systems all around us. For folks living outside and on the streets, it can be a profound sense of inadequacy brought on by early exposure to trauma, perpetuated by years of people passing them by as if they don't exist at all. Did you know that folks on the streets have a name for the rest of us? They call us normies. And this is shocking to me for many reasons, but it's as if to say, right, that the difference between those living on the streets and the rest of us is that our experience is, quote, normal. And while on the surface, this dynamic might seem perfectly understandable, the deeper reality that we are reminded of in Pentecost is that we are all in this together. There's no normal and not normal. Willie Jennings writes, this is real grace. I read this earlier, untamed grace. It is the grace that replaces our fantasies of power over people with God's fantasy for desire for people. And so you see, there's nothing normal in God's eyes, about rich and poor, amen? About empowered and disempowered, about peace and injustice. We are being called back to look around and see this reality, God's reality, that it's his desire for us to be joined together, to play our role, to benefit from the role of another in this greater story of transformation, transforming the ashes of our suffering into the beauty that God desires for all of us. And so for many of us, this begins uh, with this all-important paradigm shift. Hear this. The simple yet profound recognition that, friends, we need each other. As I heard sung in a chorus in my sort of modern-day Pentecost moment, We need to lean on one another. And in fact, we're created for one another. Those with great material need, such as our unhoused neighbors, need you, and you need them. Perhaps one of the neatest things that's happened for me throughout this Common Compassion Initiative has been sort of a shift in my um, understanding of, of, of my place, my relationship with those that are living outside. And I can tell you, I had the unique experience in preparation for this of doing three days of video shoots back to back to back at Aurora Commons. And two amazing things happened for me in that time. Uh, the first, I got to witness folks at the commons doing their thing. And let me tell you, there's nothing more beautiful than that. One person in particular, one of the founders of the commons, Sparrow Carlson, who I got to speak at an event with just a few nights ago, um, she perhaps embodies in a way, even above and beyond anybody else, what this spirit of compassion can look like. I remember one instance in particular, my head is swimming with things going on, trying to get, you know, get all the logistics in place. And there's Sparrow with an individual in crisis and she recognizes the person and she says to them, hello, you're here. I'm so excited to see you. And then gives a big hug. 
That was just normal, everyday life. That's compassion. And I was struck by that. Second thing that happened for me, I got to sit across from folks asking the questions and listening to their stories. And I can tell you there's not one story that I heard that wasn't colored by trauma, brokenness, all of those things, but also wasn't full of hope and dreams and expectation for the good that is yet to come in their lives. So both of these things uh, were very profound for me. And so I sort of found myself at that point uh, kind of looking around and, 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 and wondering in the, in the days that followed, what's next for me? Maybe you've been asking this question through this initiative as well. And um, I was on a walk with a friend around Green Lake just about a week ago. And I'm going around and I see coming uh, towards me a gentleman on a bike, low ride bicycle, his hat off to the side. And I thought to myself, I recognize that guy. And indeed I did. You might've seen him in some of the videos that we've done. He goes by the name of Slim. And so Slim's coming around the lake towards me. And, you know, I'm on a walk with a friend. This friend doesn't necessarily know that I've been kind of going through this, like, inner, like, working out of God, your compassion, for, right? And I'm thinking, I got to say hi to this guy. I was genuinely excited to see him. And so Slim's coming around the lake. And I say, hey, Slim, what's up, man? And Slim sort of, I saw him react, like, who is what? And then uh, kind of, rec- I think he recognized me. And he reached out his fist gave me a fist bump as he rode by, and he was like, good to see you, man, gotta go, and kept going around the lake. That's it, simple interaction. Let me tell you, that was no, like, hug like I described with Sparrow, right? But for me, that was a step, a step in recognition, seeing my neighbor, someone I wouldn't have seen before if I wasn't thinking through it, and a willingness in the, in the moment to maybe step outside of a comfort zone not worried about what the person with me or whatever might think, not worried about what might transpire. Are we going to have a conversation or what are we going to do here? Am I going to hop on the low rider bike and try his hat? I don't know. But not worrying about those things, engaging. I think that's the calling for all of us, to engage. In Acts 2.18, we read, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And so you see at that time, this is so significant because servants, men and women, were the marginalized. And the prophet Joel takes a moment, God speaks through Joel and says, even those folks, especially those folks, are gonna have a unique revelation of the spirit. So pay attention. Slim has so much to offer. He's offered so much to me already, he doesn't even know it. And the reality is that our folks living on the streets, the marginalized among us in any demographic have so much to offer us if we're willing to look up, look around. Will you look around with me and ask the question, Spirit, where have I disengaged? And be so bold as to ask God, will you help me re-engage? in your story. Fill me with your spirit in such a way that I can hold in tension the beauty and the suffering and at the intersection of both of those, discover my calling, my purpose. This is the task at hand, friends. Would you pray with me? Lord, what an incredible gift. We just pause and we think in a season when we've been called to give above and beyond to our common compassion initiative, Lord, when we've been called to give above and beyond our norm to try to make sense of the world around us in a time unprecedented, Lord, may we be reminded that you give good gifts to us. God, you give us the gift of your spirit, a lens through which we can see a world that we could never see if it weren't for you. Lord, may we be good stewards of these gifts of your spirit, the capacity to be unified in our diversity, to have a role in your kingdom story, and to pay attention, recognizing that others do as well, especially the most marginalized among us. 
Lord, help us to look around, help us to see your spirit in our midst, alive, working in and through us, and may our world be better for it. We commit ourselves to you towards that end in your name. Amen. Let's worship together.